What's up guys, we're back with a full NBA slate and a couple of NCAA basketball games here on Wednesday, March 27th. The Tuesday games haven't all finished, but so far things haven't gone too badly. Golden State minus two and a half, that one was good as gold. So was the under in that game, so those both came through. The Milwaukee game has been kind of a nightmare. The Bucks were up big, and it looked like the under was going to be great, but unfortunately the Bucks collapsed. That game went into overtime, and it spoiled our under bet, so that one didn't work out. Pelicans, Dallas, Georgia came through. They won that game straight up, so that ended up being a fantastic pick. Other than that, we're still waiting for the other games to finish, so hopefully we can come up with some more wins. Don't worry, guys. Just one more day, and we'll have NCAA Sweet 16 action back on the docket. Smash the thumbs up button if you like seeing these picks every day, and subscribe to the channel. Things have really been building lately, but still, look at this. Over 75% of viewers aren't subscribed. It's 100% free and can keep you from missing out on these picks. Our videos are sponsored by StumpTheSpread.com. Click the link in the description to go over there and join our free email list and check out our top confidence play on all the major sports. Comment below to let us know what bets you're looking at today and how your bracket is looking headed into the Sweet 16 or anything else you want to say about these picks, these videos, or anything you see here. Let me know if you like this mix of NBA and NCAA picks in one video or would like to see something else. I respond to every single comment and I'll give you my best advice on your picks to help us all cash some bets. Now let's dive into our first game of the day. We've got Cleveland headed to Charlotte. The Cleveland Cavaliers come into this game fresh off of a blowout win over Charlotte. This is the second game of a home and home stand between Cleveland and Charlotte. Cleveland won the first game very convincingly 115 to 92. This team has been having a little bit of trouble lately. They're very banged up. They're trying to get healthy and Right now, that's just not really happening for them. Donovan Mitchell, with his nasal fracture, currently has no timeline for his return. I would think that would be something you might want to just slap a mask on and get back in there, but I've never had a severe nasal fracture, so I guess I don't really know. Max Struess, he's been upgraded to questionable for Wednesday's game against Charlotte. I don't think we will see him play in this game. I guess since he has been upgraded, it's possible, but with a knee situation like that and they need him healthy for the playoffs, they're probably not going to be pushing to get him back or really to get Donovan Mitchell back right now. They're still a half game up on the Knicks for the three seed, and they're probably not going to be catching the Milwaukee Bucks for the two seeds. They don't have a ton to play for right now, and the focus really needs to be getting healthy, and there's no reason to be rushing them back against a team that you're a 10.5 point favorite against. The Charlotte Hornets come into this game not looking too hot. They obviously just lost in the first part of this home and home series. They lost at Cleveland, 115 to 92. Not the best game. Not that there really are very many best games for Charlotte. They're not a team that's scoring the ball very well right now. Brandon Miller is playing great. Like, don't get me wrong, the rookie is playing amazing. He definitely should be giving this franchise hope for the future once they get LaMelo Ball back. If he and Brandon Miller can develop some chemistry, this team can be really, really good. And by really, really good, I mean much better than we're used to seeing the Charlotte Hornets be. This team has not been having a good time at all this season. They've lost eight of their last 10 overall in five in a row. They're not a very good defensive team. They're allowing the second highest effective field goal percentage of any team in the league this season. That's pretty crazy. We see Charlotte is only 14 and 19 against the spread playing at home this year. That's another pretty bad number. This squad just doesn't really have a lot of positive things going for them. We're looking at Cleveland minus 10 and a half in this one. I think they find the way to get the blowout win and cover. Once again, I know taking them to get a blowout win twice in a two-game little mini-series like this does seem a little bit sketchy, but I think it's definitely the value in this one. We're also looking at the over-under in this game. The over-under is a very small number. It's 207 and a half. However, we see that Cleveland is a solid under team. They're 53.8% to the under, and Charlotte is also a solid team, 52.1% to the under. Also, just looking at, like, regular statistics for this, we see that Cleveland isn't putting up a crazy amount of points right now without their full roster, and we see that Charlotte is not really a team that's going to score a lot of points, even against a Cleveland team that doesn't have all of its pieces. Cleveland's a pretty decent team. Mobley's going to be playing in this one. Jared Allen's going to be playing in this game, so their defense is fully intact. Give me Cleveland minus 10.5 and, and give me under 207.5. Next up, we're looking at the Los Angeles Clippers going up against the Philadelphia 76ers. The Clippers come into this game fresh off back-to-back -back losses, including including a loss, a 121 to 107 loss at home against the 76ers. Now they're playing in Philadelphia. That loss to the 76ers, not a great look. We saw Paul George, Kawhi, and James Harden all playing in that game. Russell Westbrook wasn't quite back yet. He is back now, and I think we expect him to play in this game. But the Clippers are not really a team that's supposed to be losing games to teams like Philadelphia, at least Philadelphia in their current crippled state without Joel Embiid. Having Westbrook back did not make the difference against the Indiana Pacers. Their last time out, the Clippers lost 133 to 116. They only shot 30% from three-point range. If you're going to only make six three-pointers in a game in the NBA, you're going to have a hard time. That's just 
not how things are going to work right now. And it's especially not how things are going to work going up against the Indiana Pacers if you allow them to shoot 60% from three-point range. Some of that can be chalked up to hot shooting, sure, but some of that has to be chalked up to the Clippers not playing very good perimeter defense. The Clippers this season overall are allowing an effective field goal percentage of 54.5%, which has them right in the middle of the league. But over their last three games, they're allowing an effective field goal percentage of nearly 62%. You can't defend like that and expect to win games in the NBA. It is just not going to happen. The Clippers are 18 and 18 against the spread playing on the road this season, so they don't really have good road trends in their favor. This squad has just not been getting it done lately. Their bench hasn't been quite as good. Kawhi hasn't been quite as good. It has hurt them in the standings. They're six and a half games back of the Denver Nuggets, but more importantly, they're only two games up on the Mavs, the Kings, and the Pelicans, or really just that group in the race to avoid the play-in tournament in the West. If this team drops into the play-in tournament, that could be pretty detrimental. That's a huge, huge like collapse from them here in the second half of the season. The dream would be that they can figure this thing out, obviously, and they have a chance for some revenge here going up against the Philadelphia 76ers who come into this game fresh off a loss to the Kings. It was a very low scoring loss. Philly only scored 96 points in that game. They were playing at Sacramento, so we'll cut them a little bit of slack. And Tyrese Maxey, man, he is just having to carry the entire load right now. Every so often, it feels like Tobias Harris will go off for like 25 points and everybody will be like, oh my god, Tobias Harris is so good. He's such like a great He's like the best role player in the league or like something crazy like that. Tobias Harris is a no-show most nights. He scored 12 points in the loss to the Kings, guys. 12 points in 26 minutes. He shot 5 of 15 from the field and 0 of 2 from three-point range. Yeah, get out of here with that Tobias Harris love. I'm not hearing any of it. Maxi is out there by himself. Honestly, we're really seeing how absolutely dominant and insanely good Joel Embiid was playing because this team was winning games with just him and Maxi and nobody else. We don't really know if we're going to see Embiid again this season, but he's not walking through that door anytime soon. Philadelphia coming into this game, their defense hasn't been amazing, but over the course of this season, it's been very good. They're in the top 10 in effective field goal percentage allowed, so that's respectable and they can feel good about the fact they just dominated the Clippers. However, this it feels like a pretty big event spot for the Clippers. LA is only minus five and a half in this game. I know this is a bounce back spot for them. They have to turn this corner at some point and going up against the 76ers in a revenge spot feels like a position where that could happen to me. Give me the LA Clippers minus five and a half in this one as a small lean. It's not going to be one of my bigger bets of the night, but you would surely think they're going to figure it out and get the job done against the Tyrese Maxey solo act. Looking at the over under in this game, it's at 218 and a half. There aren't huge trends in this one. We do see the Clippers are 55.1% to the under, so that's pretty big and we see that the 76ers they're a 50 50 over under team there's nothing really to gain from that however philly is not exactly tearing it up scoring the ball right now the problem with going for the under in this one to me is that the clippers have been playing such bad defense but surely they can lock down a team that only has one good score or hopefully they're gonna at least try since they just got kind of humiliated by this team give me the under as another small lean in this one i'll just be sprinkling this in to go along with the minus five and a half Next up, we've got the New York Knicks going on the road to take on the Toronto Raptors. New York comes into this game playing great. Right now, they're sitting in the four seed in the East. Despite all the injuries that they've gone through, they've got themselves sitting in position to have home court advantage in the first round of the Eastern Conference playoffs. They've won two in a row. They've won seven of the last 10 overall, and they are just killing it right now. Their last time out, they took down the Pistons in a blowout. Before that, they won a relatively close one against the Brooklyn Nets. The Knicks come into this game relatively healthy for what they have on the roster right now. We do see OG is still listed as inactive for this game against Toronto dealing with that weird, weird elbow situation that is just ongoing. The hope for this squad is that they eventually end up with Mitchell Robinson back and Julius Randle back, and we'll see how good they can really be. We also need to be thinking a little bit here about how Tibbs tends to run his guys into the ground. How much are they really going to have left in the tank once the playoffs come around? But that's not really something to worry about in this game necessarily. Right now, we see the Knicks solidly as a top 10 defensive team in opponents' effective field goal percentage allowed. They've allowed an effective field goal percentage of 53% over their la at home this season, and over their last three games down to 51.2%. They are absolutely locking in on the defensive end of the court, which is what we expect from this squad and from Thibodeau coach teams in general. We saw Dante DiVincenzo go off for 11 three-pointers in that win over the Pistons. That was pretty crazy. Just in general, this team is firing on all cylinders, and that can make things extremely tough for their opponent in this one, the Toronto Raptors, who come into this game riding a long losing streak. Toronto has actually managed to drop their last 11 in a row. This team is just tanking it out pretty hard, pretty obviously as well. We've got quickly an RJ Barrett sitting out. There's a bunch of weirdness going on with betting irregularities surrounding Jonte Porter's games. 
Guys, we don't know anything about that. I wish we did. If we did, we'd let you know. Toronto is not a good defensive team at all, ranking in the bottom five teams in the league in effective field goal percentage allowed. Just in general, this team is not competing on a nightly basis. They just lost to the Brooklyn Nets. Before that, they lost to the Wizards. During this streak, they've lost to the Pistons, the Blazers. They're not doing anything positive. There's nothing good coming out of this. No young players are getting like valuable reps, it doesn't feel like to me. Like when you have absolutely no chance to win and you're just running out there and just running around, just rolling the ball out and playing. I don't think this really helps them build too much for the future. Looking at the spread in this one, we see that the Raptors are getting 12 and a half points. That is an awful lot of points. The Knicks are a good road team. They're 18, 14, and 2 against the spread on the road. And we see Toronto is a near league worse, 13 and 23 against the spread playing at home. So we're definitely going to take the Knicks minus 12 and a half in this one. It's not going to be our biggest bet on this game. For that, you're going to have to look at the over-under. The over-under in this game is a low one. It's only 209.5, but the Knicks are a crazy under team this year. They're 62% to the under, and Toronto, they're not a crazy under team, but they're also better towards the under here recently as they play very little offense, or they just don't really have the talent to play offense, it doesn't feel like. They're 52.1% to the under, so in addition to the Knicks minus 12.5, my bigger bet on this game is going to be the under 209.5. Next up, we're looking at the Indiana Pacers going on the road to take on the Chicago Bulls. Indiana comes into this game fresh off of a very solid win at the LA Clippers, and they continue this road trip. They started things off on the road with a blowout win over Detroit, a solid win over the Warriors, a tough 150 to 145 loss to the Lakers, gonna need to play some better defense, and then that solid win over the Clippers. Going against the Bulls in this one, they have to feel pretty good about their chances. Although in the season series, the Bulls actually have a two to one edge. The last time these two teams met up, the Pacers lost 129 to 132 in overtime. And that wasn't too long ago. It was only about two weeks ago back on March 13th. At this point, the Pacers are a well-oiled machine though. They're playing much better recently. Their defense still not something you wanna write home about. And there really haven't been any positive trends to affect that lately. They're just not a very good defensive team. Solidly in the bottom bottom half of the league and effective field goal percentage allowed. Tyrese Halliburton is playing great. This team really, really played well against the Clippers. They shot the lights out in that game. They made 17 of 28 threes for a 60% mark. That's absolutely crazy. We don't expect them to be able to repeat something like that. However, they're going up against a Bulls team that's really nothing special either, so maybe they've got a chance to have another big scoring night. Chicago comes into this game fresh off of a third straight loss. They just embarrassingly lost to the Washington Wizards by two. That's pretty awful. We saw a career Russo get that flagrant one, shoving Jordan Poole after Jordan Poole had already shoved him. So I don't know. We're not really going to draw too many conclusions from that. The Bulls aren't in a great spot right now, but it does look like they are going to make the play-in tournament. <laughs> they're sitting in the nine seed. I don't know why they keep this group together, guys. This seems pretty much where they're stuck. I guess they couldn't trade Levine to anyone, so they're going to have him back next year. And it's just going to be a weird, weird situation where this team continues to wallow in mediocrity. We have seen DeMar DeRozan have his moments this year, but nothing like last season where he was absolutely insane felt unguardable a lot of the time. The Bulls seem like they would be a better defensive team, but they're actually not. They're allowing an effective field goal percentage of 55.5%, which has them in the bottom two thirds of the league. They're ranked 20th overall in defense. So not exactly something you want to write home about. This team just isn't finding a way to get it done right now. They've lost six of their last 10 overall. They're riding a three game losing streak. They're just not having a very good time. Chicago playing at home this season hasn't been very good. They're 16, 20 and one against the spread at home. Not a good number, especially if you're going up against a Pacers team that is 20, 15 and one against the spread on the road. We're definitely gonna be taking the Pacers minus two and a half in this one. Looking at the over under in this game, we see that Indiana is a 50, 50 team, but Chicago is 56.3% to the over. The total is a little high for me. It's 132 and a half. So I don't necessarily think we'll be on this over under in a big way. I guess give me a slight taste of the over in this game, but I'm pretty much going to be staying away from that one. Next up, we got the San Antonio Spurs going on the road to take on the Utah Jazz. The most important thing to look at for this San Antonio game is the availability of Wembenyama. Is he going to be playing in this game? Right now, he is questionable for this one. Obviously, his availability is going to make all the difference in this matchup. Right now, we see San Antonio is plus two in this one. I think that indicates that the odds makers believe that Wembenyama is not going to be playing in this game, but I'm not really 100% sure. You never know how much faith they're really putting in the Jazz. Markkanen is expected to play in this game, so possibly they think the Jazz aren't too bad. The Spurs managed without Wembenyama to get a two-point win over the Phoenix Suns. Absolutely 
horrendous loss there for the Suns. Phoenix needs to be trying to win games right now, and that did not happen in that one. The Spurs are only 3-7 and seven over their last 10 games. Obviously, this is not a team that's really trying to win right now. However, when you see Wemby out there, you know they kind of have a chance, especially against some of the worst teams in the league, but there's really no upside for them to be winning games at this point. Utah comes into this game. They are also not playing very well. They're fresh off a 10-point loss to the Dallas Mavericks. They did keep things relatively competitive in that game for a bit, but not all the way down the stretch. We see Chris Dunn is suspended for this one because of that altercation in Saturday's loss to the Rockets. So he won't be available. Markkanen is listed as day-to-day, -day, and it appears that he's closer to questionable for this one with his right quadriceps contusion. It seems like Utah's pretty much tanking this out too. It's going to be interesting with a, with a battle between two teams that both want to lose this game. We see Utah is 22-14 and 14 against the spread at home. Utah minus two is going to be our bigger bet on this game. Looking at the over-under, there's not a whole lot to find. We see that Utah is 53.5% to the over and San Antonio is 52.9% to the under. That kind of is a total wash. I'm not going to be betting the over-under on this game, guys. Sorry. That's just not going to be part of my journey for this one. I have absolutely no clue what this one's going to look like. We don't even know if Wembenyama is going to play, so stay tuned. See if we can find out some more injury news, and then we'll be able to make better decisions on this one. Next up, we have the Phoenix Suns going on the road to take on the Denver Nuggets in one of the marquee games of the day. We see Phoenix coming into this game fresh off that embarrassing loss to the San Antonio Spurs in a game where the Spurs didn't even have Wemby out there on the court. In that loss, the Suns only scored 102 points. That's going to be a huge problem. This team isn't good enough on defense to be putting up small numbers like that, especially when you've got KD, Beal, and Booker all playing in this game. The whole shtick with this big three was that they were going to be unbeatable when they were healthy. Well, they were healthy, and they just lost to the freaking Spurs. They didn't even have that bad of a shooting night. Sure, they didn't get to the line a lot, but they shot 50% from the field. They shot 35% from three. They made 10 threes. Like, what is going on here? The bench was pretty much a black hole, except for Royce O'Neal, who had a very nice night, scoring 12 points in his 26 minutes but just in general guys this team i don't know everybody says you should be scared of them in the playoffs they're not looking too scary right now. Defensively, the Suns are in the top 10. Over the last three games, they're allowing an effective field goal percentage of around 50%. So that's very, very good. If this team's going to be better on defense, that will definitely help them. But I don't think they want to be playing games that finish with final scores of like less than 110 points. It just doesn't seem like it's going to be the wheelhouse for this offensive-minded squad. The Suns are relatively healthy coming into this game. Although we do have some concerns, Bradley Beal is dealing with a finger injury and he's officially questionable to play in Wednesday's game, but he did not practice on Tuesday. Day. So that feels like a very real questionable to me. Like there's a real chance that he might not play in this game. Obviously, that's a big problem if he doesn't. More importantly, though, we see that Nurkic is listed as questionable with an ankle injury. He only played 19 minutes against the Spurs. So I guess there's some chance that he could maybe miss this game too. If the Suns are really that banged up, if either one of those players don't go against Denver, that is a huge, huge problem for them. The Nuggets come into this game. They're playing great as they round into playoff form here. The Nuggets have won nine of their last 10 over. Overall, they're currently in sole possession of first place in the Western Conference, where they belong. This team has looked like the best team in the NBA, or at least the best team in the Western Conference. And they beat the Celtics, so I think we can pretty clearly say they look like the best team in the NBA right now. Denver hasn't exactly been playing the strongest schedule lately. Their last two wins were a close one against Portland and a blowout win over Memphis. Before that, though, they did comfortably beat New York and win a close one over the Timberwolves. Jokic is playing absolutely insane. We do have some injury concerns going into this game, though. Joel Murray is currently questionable with his ankle issue. That's kind of been an ongoing deal, though. I think he is relatively likely to play in this game, but you're going to need to wait and see an actual injury report. Michael Porter Jr. is probable due to an illness. I think he'll definitely be out there. We see Aaron Gordon. He's questionable with plantar fascia strain in his right foot. That's something you're definitely going to want to monitor. If he's out there, it makes a huge, huge difference for the entire way they can run their offense. And we see Jokic. He's probable due to lower back pain and left hip inflammation. He just gets the, gets the crap beat out of him every single night. That's not too surprising that he's dealing with some nagging soreness, but I think we definitely expect him to play. Looking at the spread in this game, it's Denver minus six and a half with Phoenix being banged up and they're only 15, 19, and one against the spread. I kind of tend to look towards Denver in this one, but that feels like a lot of points. The Nuggets are 18, 16, one against the spread at home and have been much better playing against the spread at home but against the spread isn't going to be our biggest bet on this game the over under is 224 and a half we see that phoenix is a great under team they're nearly 55 percent to the under and denver is one of the better under teams in the league they're 58.3 percent to the under we're going to smash the under in this one it's definitely going to be our biggest bet on this game and it could be one of our bigger bets on the day also we could get great help from the injury report if we see a bunch of guys sit out the under looks even better hopping over to the ncaa for the two and 
NIT games we have today. First up, we're looking at UNLV going against Seton Hall. UNLV has made it to the NIT quarterfinal thanks to taking down Princeton and Boston College. In that nine point win over Boston College, they looked very good. We saw Keelan Boone finish with 19 points and eight boards, and his twin brother added 16 points and six boards off the bench. The Running Rebels did not finish the regular season like they wanted to, but they were a very good team in the Mountain West. Overall, this squad can play some solid defense. Their offensive numbers have looked very good since the end of the season with 84 points and 79 points in their two NIT games. This squad seems like they care about this tournament enough. That's one of the biggest things you want to look at in the NIT. Their rebounding numbers are a little bit concerning, but I'm talking about their rebounding numbers over the course of the season, not necessarily their rebounding numbers here in the NIT tournament. Against Boston College, they did lose the battle of the boards, but they kept things relatively competitive and they made up for it by shooting 47% from three-point range. Seton Hall made it to the NIT quarterfinal by beating St. Joseph's and then winning a very, very convincing game over North Texas. Seton Hall's a team that can definitely feel like they got snubbed out of their chance to compete in the NCAA tournament, but the problem with them was they weren't able to keep things even close to competitive against squads like Creighton or UConn during the regular season. Seton Hall has looked very good here in the NIT, but they haven't really played any tough opponents. Going up against UNLV is definitely going to be their biggest test by far. Seton Hall is currently minus four and a half for this game. We see UNLV is a very solid eight and three against the spread on the road, and they're getting points in this one. Seton Hall is only 10 and nine against the spread playing at home. Give me UNLV in this one. They've been playing tougher teams and they've been playing great. I think they find a way to at least keep this to a one possession game, if not win straight up against Seton Hall. Last but not least, we're looking at the VCU Rams going up against the Utah Utes. VCU comes into this game. They beat USF and Villanova to make it to this point. Holy crap, those are some very, very solid wins. Maybe two of the best teams you could possibly beat in the NIT. VCU, they kind of got snubbed. They didn't really look that great down the stretch and their lack of success against teams like Dayton and Richmond during the regular season, or at least at the end of the regular season, really cost them with the selection committee. However, here in the NIT, this team is playing great. USF is one of the biggest snubs from the NCAA tournament and VCU found a way to knock them out of the NIT. I do think South Florida might've been a little bit under motivated in this tournament as they definitely deserved an NCAA bid, but what are you gonna do? The Rams took advantage and they took the win. They made 10 three-pointers in their win over South Florida. We saw three starters scoring double figures. They had a double figure scorer off the bench. They won that game despite losing the battle of the boards, which isn't a huge shock because VCU has not been a great rebounding team over the course of the season. They're gonna need to be a little bit better on the boards in this one though, going up against a Utah team that has beat UCI and Iowa to make it here to the NIT quarterfinal. Utah was a team that had very high hopes in the middle of the season where they went on a very solid winning stretch, but clearly did not do enough to deserve an NCAA bid. This team is a very solid rebounding squad in the win over Iowa. They dominated the boards. They shot the ball well from three. We saw Madsen go off for 31 points in that win. That's pretty crazy. Looking at the spread in this one, it's Utah minus six, and they're playing at home where they've been amazing. They've been 12 and six against the spread at home. However, they're going against a VCU team that is red hot, and they are nine and two against the spread playing on the road. This was a tough one for me, guys. I'm not going to be on this game in a huge way. I think VCU finds a way to keep this game relatively close, although their weakness on the boards makes me a little bit nervous. Give me VCU plus six, but this is a very, very small lean. That's all the games we have for today, guys. Hit that like button for good luck on all your bets and subscribe if you're new. Let me know in the comments any questions you have on today's slate. Thanks for watching. You can click the link in the description to go over to stumpthespread.com and we'll see you guys tomorrow for more sports betting action.